Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to the 19th lecture on economics, management and entrepreneurship. If you recall, in our last two lectures, we had very elaborately discussed financial statements. In that, two mandatory financial statements are the balance sheet and the profit and loss statement. Also important is a statement of cash flows which although not mandatory many companies usually prepare and publish. Now how to make a good analysis of these financial statements and what conclusions can be drawn and how to make interpretations of the numerical figures that appear in the financial statements. That is the subject of today which we call analysis of financial statements. Firstly, let us understand that the information obtained from the financial statements can be of great value to the stakeholders of any company. There are different types of stakeholders of a company. Shareholders or the owners can decide whether to retain or sell their stocks in the company. If the company is not doing very well, the shareholders may decide to sell their stocks and if it is doing quite well the shareholders may decide to retain their stocks. The general public can decide whether it was the right time for them to invest in their money in buying the stocks. The lending institutions can decide on the credit worthiness of the company. If the company is not doing well, the lending institutions may decide not to grant any more credit to this particular company when they sell their products. Manager, managers can know the working capital requirement, how well they have used the company assets. The government comes to know the health of a company. Like this, all types of stakeholders of the company benefit from the information given in the financial statements. Therefore, the question is whether it is possible to have a structured analysis of the financial statements. Usually, to carry out this analysis, the principal tool used is the financial ratio analysis. That is analysis of ratios of different items. They are called ratios and financial ratios and the analysis of the financial ratios is what is usually done to make an analysis of the financial statements. Here the ratios between different groups of items in the final sales statements are computed to judge how a company has performed in the last year. So basically it is the financial ratio analysis that is done on the financial statements to understand the meaning, to interpret the values and to understand 
the financial status of an organization. Now, there are different types of financial ratios, liquidity ratios, leverage ratios, turnover ratios, profitability ratios, dividend ratios and expense ratios. So, you can see that ratios can be categorized in at least 6 headings. So, we will take off look at this plural number plural uh, plural form of the word ratios this means under liquidity ratios there are quite a few ratios under leverage ratios there are a quite few ratios like that. So, each category of ratios has got a number of ratios and let us see one by one. First the liquidity ratios this ratios these ratios indicate the ability of a firm to meet its short term obligations indicating short term solvency that is its liquidity condition whether it is having sufficient cash or cash equivalents. The very first ratio which is the most popular ratio popular liquidity ratio is called the current ratio. Current ratio is the ratio of current assets to current liabilities. Now, these figures are actually collected from the balance sheet values of current assets and current liabilities. Just I would like to keep it open to refer to it whenever there is a need. Current assets is 4 million 650 thousand rupees and current liabilities is 2 million 500 thousand rupees. So, the ratio of current assets to current liabilities is 4 million 650,000 divided by 2 million 500,000 which comes to 1.86. A thumb rule which is used for the current ratio is that it should be close to 2. Of course, for different types of companies they can differ for public utility companies this ratio could be as low as only 1 whereas, for a dealer wholesale dealer the value is as large as 2.5. Now, when it is 2 it means you should have much more assets current assets than current liabilities. Now, try to recall what the current assets is look at look at the current assets of land this is fixed assets of course, current assets have cash receivables or debtors this accounts receivables inventories and prepaid expenses. And if you look at this figure that I had given this cash is the most liquid form of current asset, inventory is the least liquid, accounts receivable is more liquid. We take the sum of cash, inventory, accounts receivable and prepaid expense as our current asset. So, we are assuming that they are convertible to cash in this year this is the meaning of current asset. Now, the value for this company is 
so it is close to 2 so it is not very bad however because inventories take longer time to be converted into cash and because they are less liquid not current asset but if we subtract inventories from current asset and put that in the numerator then that ratio is a better indicator of the liquidity of the company because inventory is the least liquid of the three items that come under current assets. So, inventories amount to 1,500,000 rupees this was obtained from the assets inventories all types of inventories add up to 1,500,000 rupees. So, if we subtract 1,500,000 rupees from the total current assets figure the value becomes something like 3,150,000 rupees divided by 2,500,000 rupees and the ratio is 1.26 this is called quick assets ratio or acid test ratio because it does not consider the less liquid item of the current asset which is inventories and the thumb rule is that ratio this ratio the acid test ratio should be about 1 if it is 1 then the company is in a very good condition to meet its short term obligations or working capital needs for this company the value is 1.26. So, it is in a very very comfortable position to meet its needs the short term needs often prepaid expenses are also excluded for the same reasons because inventory is less liquid similarly prepaid expenses are also less liquid they are sometimes also subtracted from the current assets to calculate the quick assets ratio. And sometimes even the accounts receivables of the data is also subtracted then it is called super quick assets test ratio only cash divided by current liabilities. So, that is in this case only 0.38 this is this ratio is not very much used because as I told you most of the transactions today is on credit and therefore, accounts receivables have to be or has to be there subtracting accounts receivable from current asset is not a very good proposition. However, some accountants say that this super quick asset test ratio is a definite indicator of the liquidity or the liquidity position of the company. Another form of current ratios is bank finance to working capital gap ratio. Working capital is defined as current assets minus the current liabilities and we normally meet the difference by taking short term loans from the bank. So, one would like to see to what extent the short term bank borrowings relate to working capital. What is the fraction of working capital which is short term borrowing? In this case the short term bank borrowings which comes from the liability side of the balance sheet which is 850,000 and the working capital is current assets minus current liabilities then this ratio is 0.38. The Tandon committee report says that this ratio should not exceed 0.75. So, this company short term borrowing is much less than 0.75 which means it is in a very comfortable position as far as the borrowings from the bank 
is concerned to meet its working capital needs. The second type of ratios is known as leverage ratios. Now, normally capital the source of capital for a company is either selling shares or taking loans. Usually debt capital is cheaper, but riskier and the leverage ratios highlight how this debt capital has been utilized. Now, there are two classes of leverage ratios structural ratios and coverage ratios. Under structural ratios we have debt equity ratio and debt assets ratio. Under coverage ratios we have interest coverage ratios and fixed charge coverage ratio. Let us see what they mean. Debt equity ratio is your total amount of money that you have got, how much of it is financed by your own shareholders and how much of it is through debt. So, debt to equity is the debt equity ratio. So, equity is both forms of equity that is common stock and preference stock plus other retained earnings and surpluses. In our case, the share capital, if you look at the liability side, it came to 2 million 800 thousand, resource and surplus came to 1 million 700 thousand. This we can see if we look at the look at this share capital equity capital is 2 million, preference capital is 800, together it is 2 million 800 thousand and reserves and surplus in our case it was only accumulated return earnings, there was no surplus, it came to 1 million 700 thousand. So, it is this that we are writing in the denominator, this is the total capital invested and of this uh, uh, invested in the form of owner's equity. Now, how much the capital we have got from through debt? This amount is secured loans, unsecured loans and current liabilities and provisions. So, this also we can see from the liabilities, secured loans, unsecured loans and current liabilities. So, this totaling will give us the debt. And this came to 5 million 200 thousand and the ratio is 1.16. Now, in this case the share capital includes both equity and preference capital that I already I said debt usually considers both long and short term loans. Often of course, current liabilities are excluded in the computation of this ratio, because we are talking about long term loans. So, sometimes this part is excluded. Now, normally thumb rule is that one should not go for very high value of value of equity, because if the ownership base is increased, then there are large number of owners which is sometimes not wanted. Companies want to have their ownership to a less number relying more on debt. So, thumb rule is that this ratio should be 2 is to 1, but it is seen that for capital intensive industries such as cement and fertilizer who require more capital, they finance their, their capital by the instrument of debt. This ratio can be as high as 4 is to 1. For shipping companies or 
uh, aeroplane manufacturing aeroplanes. The companies require very high capital that can go even up to 6 is to 1. Whereas, it is seen that in capital rich countries such as USA and European countries, they go for very little debt and they rely on more equity shares. So, these are thumb rules, but basically the ratio should be close to 2 is to 1 which is a which is an average number uh, for any industry, but of course, depending on the type of companies it can differ. Debt assets ratio of the total assets, what is the amount of debt? In this case it is 0 0.54, debt as is to assets is same as debt by equity divided by assets by equity. So, debt by equity is the debt equity ratio and assets by equity because assets is equity plus debt divided by equity, we can write this as 1 plus debt by equity. Therefore, debt, debt asset ratio is same as debt equity ratio divided by 1 plus debt equity ratio. Next, we consider the interest coverage ratio. Interest coverage ratio is basically a ratio of PBIT profit before interest and tax and debt interest. This is the amount of interest that you are supposed to pay and how much you have got as profit before paying interest and taxes. Is it more than 135,000? because out of this the interest will be paid to find out profit before tax. In this case the value is very high quite high which is 6. This means that it is in a very comfortable position to make its payment. The ratio measures the margin of safety the firm has to meet its interest burden. A high value of this ratio means that the firm can comfortably meet its interest burden. An alternative measure of this ratio considers depreciation as it is a source of cash flow. We will discuss about depreciation uh, about 2 3 lectures later and we shall show that depreciation actually reduces the tax and therefore, it is an indirect source of cash flow and therefore, depreciation is sometimes added to PBIT in its numerator. If it is considered then the value is even higher which is 12.67. So, in any case this company is doing pretty well as far as meeting its interest burden is concerned. Next we talk about the turnover ratios or activity ratios or asset management ratios. These ratios measure the efficiency with which the firm employs its assets. It depicts the relationship between the level of activity represented by sales or COGS and assets level. And there are 5 types of turnover ratios, inventory turnover, receivables turnover, fixed assets turnover, total assets turnover ratios and an average collection period which is also calculated as a ratio, but the word ratio does not appear in this case. Let us consider each one of this in detail. First the inventory turnover ratio, basically it finds out in a year how much sales you have made and how much inventory you are having on an average. Of course, th this means this ratio means that so many times the inventory has turned over at this rate. If you have sold 6.5 million rupees 
and if you are holding 1.5 million rupees worth of things on an average it means that to be able to make this sell four times the inventory has turned over that is the meaning. So, close to 4.33 and a few things to know one is that net sales is not the uh, main thing the main thing is COGS because net sales is calculated at the rate of price whereas, the cost of goods sold actually indicates the manufacturing cost. So, instead of net sales quite often COGS is taken and inventory is calculated not at the end of the year inventory level we have taken here end of the year inventory level as it appeared in the balance sheet. For example, look at the balance sheet inventories it was 1,500,000, but this is only the end of the year inventory and uh, if you look at the income statement. income statement the net sales is 6,500,000 whereas, the cost of goods sold correspondingly was less 5,300,000. Now, what I am trying to say is that normally it should not have been net sales it should be COGS the cost of goods sold and it should not be the end of the inventory which appeared in the balance sheet, but it should be the average of the inventory held. So, how can you get the average of the inventory held? If you see the last year's inventory level that means, if you consult the balance sheet of last year and see how whatever amount of inventory was left with and at the end of this year whatever amount you are left with sum the two divide by two what you get is the average inventory held in this year. So, division of cost of goods sold by the average inventory held could also be taken as the inventory turnover ratio this is what I am trying to tell you. A high value of this ratio indicates a better management of inventory. So, if you are selling this amount but you are having an inventory of let us say 3 million it means that you are holding much more inventory to be able to sell this much of amount. If instead you are holding only only 500,000 then this value is close to 12 or 13 it means that your inventory management is much better because inventory is always an idle stock. So, less it is the better it is. So, this tells the high value of this ratio is always better of course, it indicates the possibility of stock out lost sale and loss of customer goodwill. So, there is a risk involved, but in any case the higher the value the better it is and the same thing is done for receivable turnover ratio only thing the denominator is not the is not the inventory, but receivables in this case it is 3.25 which means that whatever amount is receivable cash sales is much larger and uh, credit sales is less. So, the higher it is the better it is. Now, average collection period accounts receivables this is the amount that you are expecting to get from the customers divided by average sales per day is the average collection period and this is equal to receivables divided by average sales per day assuming 360 days it should be it will be net sales divided by 360. So, 360 can go up receivables can come down. So, it is 360 divided by net sales by receivables net sales by receivables is nothing but receivables turnover ratio. 
So, this is nothing but 360 divided by receivable star number ratio. So, 360 divided by 3.25 it is 111.13. It means that on an average the company is able to get its payment from its customers who have purchased their items and credit sales within 100 and or after 111 days. And 111 days means about 4 months, 30 days, 30 days in a month, 4 months means 120 days. A value of average collection period higher than the credit terms of the firm means that the collection is slow. Thus, if the allowed credit period is just 2 months, 60 days, and on an average you are getting the receipts in 4 months or 111 days, 111 days, it means that the it is a matter of concern for the firm. Their cash position is not it may be affected because of this late payment. Fixed assets turnover ratio is net sales by fixed assets. This is 2.03. Basically, fixed assets is something like the capital that is invested and this is the amount you are getting. A high value of this ratio indicates that the fixed assets are employed with high efficiency. There is however, a danger that old depreciated assets may show off high value because old depreciated assets meaning fixed assets value will be less and they may give very high values of fixed assets turnover ratio. Similarly, total assets turnover ratio is net sales by total assets and this is similar to output capital ratio which is used by the economists for their financial analysis. This is the capital invested and this is the output that the company is getting. So, output capital ratio is something like 0 0.67 in this case. Then we come to the next set of ratios which is the profitability ratios. There are different types of profitability ratios, they measure the profitability relative to sales and to investment. So, there are 7 types of profitability ratios being defined. First is gross profit margin ratio or just gross profit margin it is gross profit by net sales. Net sales for us was 6 million 500, gross profit was mal million 200 thousand, the ratio is 0.184 or 18.4 percent. It indicates the effects of cost of goods sold and of pricing. The company is able to get a profit gross profit of 18.4 percent. Net profit is however much less. It is net profit after tax, always net meaning after tax. And net sales is this. So, only 5 percent compared to 18 percent cross profit, the net profit is 5 percent. It means how is net profit calculated? Gross profit minus the interests and taxes. So, naturally interests was much higher and therefore, this has come down. Also gross profit uh, minus the operating expenses gives us operating profit minus the interests gives us the net profit. So, Operating expenses like selling and administrative expenses are also considerably high and therefore, the net profit has dwindled. So, one has to see how these expenses and interest expenses could be reduced. Return on investment also known as ROI. This is profit before interest and tax by total assets. Total asset is 9 million 700 thousand PBI it is 8 10. Return on investment is in our case 
3 percent. Return on equity is equity is the shareholders money. So, their investment amount is paid in capital plus reserves and surplus is the total amount the owner's equity which is coming as 4 million 500 thousand and what they are actually getting their owning preference dividends are actually to be given back always therefore, PAT minus preference dividends gives only 275,000. Therefore, what owner sees that its return on the total amount that they have invested is only 6.1 percent. Sometimes preference dividends are often ignored this amount is not subtracted it is just profit after tax divided by this equity is often taken as the average of the last year and the present year equity values just as inventory calculation was made and profitability ratios have an upward bias at times of inflationary conditions since the denominators represent historical values whereas numerator represent present values because paid in capital the shareholders may have paid their money 5 years ago where the uh, price index was less, but profit after tax is much high today and therefore, this may give a higher value. This is the danger of the return on equity and in fact, for all profitability ratios. Earnings per share EPS is another very popular ratio. The numerator is same as return because this is from the shareholders point of view and here we divide by the number of ordinary shares. Number of normally ordinary share meaning common stock the real owners not the preference shareholders. So, in this case it is assuming 20,000 at a par value of 100 that makes it 2 million rupees that was the paid in capital. So, 20,000 is the number of shares. So, the earnings per share now becomes 13 rupees 75 paise. Yet another ratio is calculated as earning per share per ordinary share divided by market price per share which is called earnings yield. Let us say the earnings per ordinary share is just 13 rupees 75 paise that we have just now calculated, but the share is selling at a price of 200 rupees in the share market. This ratio comes to something like 6.875 percent. This is known as earnings price ratio or EP ratio or earnings yield. The reverse of it is known as P E ratio the price earnings ratio which is the market price by earnings per ordinary share which is 200 divided by 13.75 in this case it is 14.5 is quite high. <coughs> then we come to dividend ratios this ratio shows how the common stockholders get paid in the form of dividends compared to the amount earned by the company and the market price of the stock. There are two types of ratios dividend yield and dividend payout. Dividend yield is defined as dividend per ordinary share divided by market price per share. Dividend paid was 100,000 ordinary share was 20,000 and the market price per share was 200 rupees 20,000 number of shares total amount of dividend paid was 100,000 therefore, per share only 5 rupees was given that divided by 200 comes to 2.5 percent. So, the dividend yield of the share is only 2.5 percent. 
Next dividend payout ratio, this is the dividends paid to common stockholders divided by net profit. In this case it is 100,000 divided by 325,000 that comes to 0 0.308 and this is also approximately equal to dividend per common stock divided by earnings per share. If you divide it by the number of shares both in the numerator and in the denominator. In the denominator if you write net profit per number of shares it becomes earnings per share and in the numerator if you divide it by number of shares it becomes dividends per common stock. In this case it indicates that about 30.8 percent of the net profit are distributed as dividends to common stockholders. Now, the last set of ratios the expense ratios there are four of them cost of goods sold ratio, COGS ratio, operating expense ratio, administrative expense ratio and selling expense ratio. In each case the denominator is net sales that means COGS ratio is COGS divided by net sales operating expense ratio is operating expense divided by net sales, administrative expense ratio is administrative expense divided by net sales and selling expense ratio is selling expense divided by net sales. In this case though the details are not shown here the COGS ratio comes as 0 0.801 that means of the total sales the cost of goods sold is 80.1 percent. The operating expense ratio is coming as there is a mistake here it should be 7.7 percent. 0 0.077 that is 7.7 percent of the net sales. Administrative expense ratio is coming as 4.6 percent of net sales and selling expense ratio is coming as 3.1 percent of net sales. Of these three you can see that the operating expense ratio that is general and administration administrative expense and selling expense together is the highest among these three. No, selling expense ratio of course is taken separately here meaning general administrative expense if, uh, administrative expenses ratio is 4.6 percent. So, together they give 7.7 percent. So, one can go into the details to find out why this is so high could this be reduced further. Now, Now that we have defined a host of different ratios, now the question is what information can we derive from out of these ratios. For that we usually make two or even three, three types of comparisons that is what is listed here. One comparison is the company finds out the ratios and plots the ratios for various years with the company's own past it is called a time series comparison or with a general rule of thumb. In a general rule of thumb meaning the thumb rule that I had given the benchmark suggested in the books or the industry average or similar such thing or it can compare with similar companies known as cross sectional comparison. Now, for example, in case of uh, a company 
which has existed for the last 5 years, it is possible to show let us say we are drawing, drawing it here. We can show year here and let us say we plot current ratio here, one of the ratios for the same company x y z company. So, in one year the value was value was somewhere here, in another year the value fell, in another year the value is very large, in the fourth year the value is close to this and let us say that this is the most recent year. In this year the value is as less as this. So, this is called a time series comparison. So, in this time series comparison you see uh, suppose that this value was something like 1.2, this value was something like 1.9 and this value is something like 0 0.5. So, this indicates how with time the value of current ratio has changed as years have progressed. Now, one can make an analysis as to why the current ratio is showing a downward trend. Similarly, profitability ratio for example, one can show how the gross profit margin has changed over years. Gross profit margin probably was 25 percent at one time got down to 22 percent, further down to 20 percent and today it stands at 18 percent. Now, why this sliding down of the values of gross profit? One can make the analysis. This is time series comparison one can make a cross sectional comparison. In the cross sectional comparison what, what is done is that companies with similar business and similar size, similar business and similar size. In the same year, same financial year, the values are plotted. Let us say we plot debt equity ratio. If you plot debt equity ratio for one company, company A, company B, company C, company D and our company X, Y, Z. The debt equity ratio for our company let us say stands at, I do not remember the value, let us say it is 1.8. Similar companies, similar companies, and similar size companies, the values are 2.5 is to 1, 2.4 is to 1, 2, 3 is to 1, 2.8 is to 1, and we stand somewhere at 1.8. Now, an analysis could be made 
as to whether this is good enough a value for the company or whether it should go for more debt and less equity for the benefit of the company in the light of the fact that most other companies in the industry have gone for debt financing rather than equity financing. Now, this is called cross sectional analysis or cross sectional comparison. Finally, when we make this analysis, it is possible to do a lot of statistical analysis like the mean value, the deviation around the mean. So, that is possible and the other thing is that if the company sizes differ, differ considerably. Say for example, a company has got 2000 employees and has a business of 6 million rupees. A smaller company has got just about 500 employees with a business of only 500,000 rupees. How can we compare? Looking at it, it is not advisable to make a comparison between the two. However, some suggest that it is possible to make a comparison if we write the balance sheet and the income statement in the form of percentages. In the balance sheet and the asset side, we can write down of the total assets different items constitute how much percentage rather than the exact amount that should add up to 100 percent. Similarly, the liabilities total liabilities if it is 100 percent then the each item in the liability constitute how much of that total liability. In the income statement the gross sales is taken as 100 percent and then from there different values are plot is calculated and written down in the form of percentages. So, it is possible to make a comparison between two companies of different sizes provided the balance sheet and the income statement are put in the form of percentages. So, friends financial statements and their analysis constitute a very important aspect of any company. It gives a lot of information to a variety of st stockholders and the principal tool of analysis of the financial statements is the financial ratio analysis. There are a large number of ratios and they should be properly analyzed to find out how policies of a company have been formed, how efficiently the company people have actually worked to make their companies a success. Thank you very much.